So we're going to continue in our wonderful theme, Let There Be Light. And so last week we were talking about that, for me anyways, that my perception is, is that we move into this holiday season with the winter solstice, that it's a time when the veil is thin, that sometimes there's places on planet Earth where we say the, the, the veil is thin, the vortex is thin. And that's what I feel this time is. We have our, we're, so we're going in a pilgrimage in time instead of rather space. So we're in the pilgrimage is to become more and more light. My invitation last week was that we practice seeing ourselves in light and seeing other people in light. So we're just moving through the, our lives, just practicing being in the light, just using our imagination. There was this moment this past week where Jack and I were getting ready to, in the morning, and usually we're just rushing and passing each other. And spontaneously, without saying a word, we both just stopped. And we just stared at each other. And for a very long time, it wasn't just like a few minutes, we just breathed. And suddenly Jack said, I'm just seeing the light in you. And I said, that's exactly what I'm seeing. And it was just this beautiful moment of seeing the light. And when we practice it more and more, that light starts to grow and become more and more real and alive. At the same time, <clears throat> and I'm only speaking for myself, next week we're going to begin, uh, people are going to share, they're doing their power shares of how you're demonstrating walking in the light in your life. But I also say that it was challenging that what I noticed is it was very hard to hold myself or hold other people in light when I'm moving around. That I had to sort of just, we had to stop. Like you can't do it, in, or at least I can't. I can't say we can't. I can't very well see other people in the light if I'm moving around or I'm on my to-do list or I have my things to do. It's a stillness. And so part of today's talk about let and the walls come tumbling down is also about focus. That what we know in all spiritual teaching is that it is by becoming more and more focused that that which is real becomes more evident to us. Let our eye be single so our whole body is full of light. So the intention is how do we stay focused? So one way we look at being focused is in a very sort of rigid way. Like our, we crinkle up our eyebrows, I'm going to stay focused, I'm going to stay focused. And, and I think that sometimes is where it gets difficult. So I want to bring the element of play into it. We all see when children start playing, they're completely focused. Julian, Julian, Julian! Because <laughs> he's immersed in playing. He's, he's focused, but it's not a rigid focus. It's an open focus. There's a wonderful teacher, philosopher, Joseph Chilton Pierce. Are any of you familiar with Joseph Chilton Pierce? He brought back natural childbirthing. He's written The Magical Child. He does a lot of work with uh, child development spiritually. And he was in this question of play. Why do children play? Why do we have this essence? Why would that be biologically necessary? We always look at everything as being a biological necessity. Why do children all around the world, and no matter what culture, no matter what time, do they play? Why is that a biological necessity? So he was, he was doing all this research. He said, I had all my papers and my notes in front of me and these books. And he said, I just wasn't getting the answer. And I was just stuck. I was just sitting there, just hit a wall. I had done all the research I possibly could. And he said, I was just sitting there. The stillness hit. And suddenly he said, I was just flown out of my body and into this universe. He says, I was being thrown by the universe like I was a big ball. And it was playing with me from one side of the universe to another. And that's when he got the essence of this universe is play. It is delight. And so when we are moving into alignment with the universe, when we're playing and we're delighting in life. So the idea of focus is not that this is this rigid, I've got to wake up to God, I've got to see the light. It's playful. It's delightful. Full. It's full of openness. So when we're in play, we're focused, but our heart and our body and our soul is open. So it, there's a receptivity into our infinite self that we don't normally experience. So as we're focusing on light this, this season to open ourselves up to experience light as we've never before, we want to have enter into it with this playfulness. It's a playful focus. So we're focused and yet completely open. And when we start to do that, the walls start tumbling, come tumbling down. Because the truth is, is all the light that has ever been, that ever will be, is fully available to us in the moment. And the reason why we're not experiencing it is because of all these various walls that we have inside of us. Some of those walls we know and are conscious of, and other walls we're not conscious of. But as we open in our hearts more and our bodies more, suddenly those knots, we start to feel them, and they start to 
come unloosened and unhinged. I had, um, there was a time where I was reading a book. I, well, I grew up in a family that was very intellectual, and I had a, a huge bias against the intellect. I thought it was just, I thought it was anti-God, it's anti-spirit. And so in Hinduism, I knew about these four paths to God. There's love, knowledge, service, and meditation, the direct path. And so, of course, I resonate with love. I love God. <laughs> so, and knowledge was something like, how could that be a path that just blocks the heart, it blocks love? And so I was, of all four of them, I was pretty anti the knowledge one. So one day I was reading Houston Smith's book, World's Religions, and he had it love reflection instead of knowledge, and that just sort of shifted my perception. And I started reading about the path of the reflective, and every sentence was me. I just thought, oh my gosh. And as I was reading it, it was this awareness that who I am and my path, this path of the reflective, has always been. It was one and the same thing. And as I realized that, suddenly... I was in this different, expanded, non-ordinary state, and I was in pure light, and the walls literally dissolved in my apartment where I was living. Everything just dissolved, and there was a homeless man on the street, and I could see him, and he was pure light, and we were one. There was no division now. I wasn't the one with the home, and he wasn't the one with, without a home. We were absolutely in the light, one. The walls came tumbling down. As soon as I cleared a wall within me, it cleared the wall externally, too. So it literally impacts how we show up in the world when we allow those, those walls within ourselves of who I think I am, how I box myself into my identity. This is my identity. Once I let that wall down, what was interesting is I actually had opened my heart rather than blocked my heart by recognizing an aspect of myself I had not, I denied that was outside my box. I had actually locked, uh, locked that part out of, my, out of my heart. But by opening up, the walls come tumbling down. And this is an incredibly powerful and wonderful experience that we're doing during this wonderful Christmas time. And I call it Christmas. We talked about Hanukkah last week. We also have this winter solstice, sometimes Diwali and Ramadan. It's all about celebrating that wonderful light in the midst of all the darkness. It's dark externally, so we can go within and find the true light. Because the light outside... You know, I, I hadn't planned to talk about it, but I was sitting standing up here, and it just came to me. I was reading this story about um, a Greek Orthodox monk and how he just lived in meditation all of the time. And he just he talked about the experience of just being living in this bright light for a period. And then he opened up his door, and he was walking outside, and he thought it was nighttime. And he was asking why people were coming to see him in the middle of the night. And they're saying, no, it's bright as day. But he was so immersed in the light that the light of this world was just like a dim reflection. It seemed like night compared to the infinite light. This light is so powerful and so transformative. And why I like, why I like the baby Christ, and, and that baby image is in many cultures. It's not just in Christianity. And the reason why we have that baby Christ is because that's the essence of that light within us, and we want to evolve and nurture it like we do a baby. So that's the, entire, that's the purpose of this pilgrimage is to nurture our interior light, our own unique expression of the soul, so that as we move into 2014, we are actually moving in as this new life. We've nurtured something new in our hearts, in our souls, in our bodies, and, and, and grown that beautiful, pure light. So as we move into 2014, it's actually a new year. We're actually experiencing it as new beings. And there's something, so there's something else that's also come up that I want to share today. As we know, Nelson Mandela died, and what an extraordinary light he was and continues to be, for he shines still. That light is eternal. He spent 27 years in prison and went through... He, was, he had pretty high ideals prior to going into prison. It's not that prison created the high, idea, uh, high ideals. They just got nurtured and developed during that time. And when he came out, he did what people didn't think was possible. They thought expected bloodshed, and instead he did, created forgiveness and reconciliation. But there's something that sticks with me. There was, I was in a conversation with someone who was talking a lot about the darkness and that there's a lot of dark energy around us too. And I was being with that, and, um, and, and that we need to fight the, the dark energy. 
But if we fight that energy, I think in some ways that gives it power. We don't want to deny that it's there, but we don't want to, to feed, feed that darkness. What, what Mandela did, and I think sometimes we forget. I mean, we, we, a lot of people are celebrating him, but we watched a documentary on him last night. And what strikes me is, I mean, they showed the history back in the 40s and the 50s. We forget how much pain and suffering and violence the black community was living in every day for a, for a long, for centuries. And that that's a lot to forgive. I mean, we look at, oh, it's this Christmas season is very difficult. It's a gift that our problems, what our problems are, because that's a way to practice the light and forgiveness and reconciliation ourselves. That's how we honor someone like Nelson Mandela is to expand in our own light because these, the darkness can be very dark and it can be very painful and, and hurt in a very deep way. And often at this time of year, it's intensified. Even as the veil is more thin, I think, at this time of the year, we feel everything more intensely. We feel the pain. We feel the loneliness. We feel the hecticness, the craziness. All the stuff that comes up is more intensified. And so it demands us to even more go deeply into the light. And so someone like Nelson Mandela reminds us that this light is infinitely powerful. It's not a wimpy light. It's not... You can have this one little beautiful baby, and yet it lights up the entire universe. There was a moment in the documentary that we saw last night where this is after Mandela came out of, the, came out of jail, and de Klerk, who was the prime minister at the time, was denouncing some of the violence in the black community. And Nelson Mandela got up right after him, and he said, well, you are a, uh, you're, you're not even supposed to be the prime minister, you're an unfairly leader, unfair leader of this country doing horrible things and you don't think I'm going to respond? What you're doing, now you have morality when everything, what you do is immoral, I'm going to respond. I'm going to reply to this. This is not okay. And it was such a strong response. Wasn't it a really just, it was unexpected. He goes, I am, and he was right at him. So he, yes, he did forgiveness, and yes, he did reconciliation, but he did it standing strongly in the light. And for me, that's what this why we're cultivating how, how this light within us is something that needs to be strong. There is a lot of darkness in our own individual worlds, in the culture in which we're living. We're seeing more stuff. People are more upset with the government and big corporations. And Occupy Wall Street, I think, is, is no longer a... Uh, we see it. We, they're not out intense, but I think it's growing underneath. There's a lot of unrest. There's a lot of unhappiness culturally around the globe and in our families and in our world. Now we have to cultivate the light within us. It is something that to me is essential. If we believe anything that what we're saying, more than just words, more than just concepts, if we actually believe this, we have to become powerful forces of light. We need to stand in strength in light and stand in what's true in light in our families, when people are not acting, we need to stand in the light. In our communities, we need to stand in the light. In our culture, we need to stand in the light. That this light is needed now more than ever because there is this incredible birthing that's happening and we want to birth the infinite light and it only happens through us. This old idea that it's going to happen through someone else, through some special person, it's not. It's happening through every individual that's in this room right now. And so we have to say, how serious am I in cultivating this light within me? Is it, is it something I'm only sort of committed to, kind of committed to it, or is it something that is my passion and in my heart? And of course, in Miracle says there's only love and fear. The challenge with that, what I've noticed, and I think sometimes it's, it's not Course in Miracles, sometimes how we interpret things, is that if we're feeling fear, then we think we're out of God, we're, out of, we're separate. But God's even in the midst of the fear. Don't let the fact that we feel fear. Every person that you hear who's commended for bravery or courage all says we feel fear. We don't stop because we feel fear. God is, that love is in the midst of the fear. So in the midst of the fear, still stand in the light. In the midst of the pain and the sadness, still stand in the light. When the things are the darkest, when those walls seem the thickest, is when it's the time that behooves us the most to do the practices that we're here to do. So it's not only when life is going easily and in the flow, it's when life is the most difficult, is when we're here to really say, I am here for light. I am here to stand in the light no matter how I personally am feeling, what's going on in my life, what's going on in the world. I am standing in the light and I will not be moved. Single eye focus. 
One power. There is not a power for good that is battling a power for negative, for dark. There is one power, and it is infinitely good. And the more we stand on that, the more we stay in that single line intention. Nelson Mandela said, I am an optimist. I just keep my feet pointed towards the sun. There are so many times where I felt like humanity was was going in a wrong way, and I didn't think I could do it, but I just kept going towards the light. I kept moving my feet in the direction of the light, and it kept showing up. The forgiveness, the reconciliation, things that people thought were absolutely impossible, single-eyed attention, he kept turning his feet towards the sun. It's great that he used the sun, that infinite oceanic light, just keeping that light, and the things that seemed like such thick walls, the walls of Jericho, just dissolve because we've stood in that light. So my invitation for us this this week is to continue in this process of seeing ourselves and others in light and make it a very important part of your day, not something that's just, oh, this would be nice, it would feel good, that this is serious. We need to become the light. That's why we show up. And so to practicing the light with a focus that is light and playful so we don't get constricted and rigid about it, so we're open and available but also to recognize this light is infinitely powerful because I think some reason why it's hard to stay open and playful is fear, and that fear is what what makes us want to constrict. Even in the fear, try to keep your heart open. Try to keep that spaciousness. Try to keep it playful. Even in the fear, allow that love because that love and that light is more powerful than anything you're afraid of, and that's what we have to start knowing more than we've ever known before is that love and that light that we're open up to the hearts and our bodies is more powerful than anything else that is happening in this world and in our personal life, than our emotions, than our relationships, than our money, than health. Whatever's happening, that love and that light is the only power of this universe. Let us stand in that.